स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया Good morning. So we will continue with our uh, uh, reading of melodrama and classic Hollywood. As we were talking about it the other day, melodrama is a highly popular genre anywhere in the world, and we were talking about classic Hollywood, and it's one of the major genres in classic Hollywood. Generally used in a very derisive, very pejorative way, by and uh, a means to uh, which was generally understood. as something a kind of drama that manipulated the audience's emotions we were also talking about uh, the indian melodrama we refer to films like uh, even our own shole and mother india and diwar and the more recent films like kabhi khushi kabhi gham so they all fall in the category of melodrama uh, generally in the film industry the term is used to denote dramas involving passion we have crime melodramas we have psychological melodramas family melodramas things which we are extremely familiar with women's films and romantic dramas think uh, consider a classic love triangle even devdas is a classic uh, romantic melodrama now um, melodrama attained a certain status with the interest in the works of people like nicholas ray and i am going to question you who got interested in these people you are already familiar with nicholas ray right rebel without a cause yeah so you are not no stranger to these names anymore vincent minnelli hmm max offels have you done anything by max offels lola montes we were talking about earrings of madame the hmm and otto preminger i refer to a movie called laura a film noir douglas sirk now douglas sirk was uh, uh, has been understood, uh, understood as a key maker of melodrama in hollywood and who were the people who in, got interested in melodrama okay all these people who are now considered authors today okay and their images have been built up or hyped up by kayer the cinema critics so today these uh, filmmakers are res, uh, referred to with great respect even the melodrama is referred to with great respect by film scholars because the kind of interest that kayer the cinema critics showed in their works molly haskell of course some of you are familiar with the works of molly haskell right women you have heard of her in 1979 drew attention to women's films with family melodrama and raised question about the aesthetic and cultural significance of this kind of cinema now what did she mean she said that we should not be dismissive about melodrama generally we think melodrama is a tear jerker okay some a genre which is used to exploit emotion you know use the more tears the audience shed the more tickets it will sell that's the idea Molly Haskell said that in spite of this in spite of this tendency in melodrama the thing is that these family melodramas romantic melodramas uh, drama uh, raise certain questions about cultural period of a particular time in american history okay this was the way women were treated in american history at a particular point um perhaps you would like to draw on from your own understanding of indian melodrama you the other day we were talking about diwar and mother india do you think it raises certain questions about how women were treated in a particular period do you agree with me elaborate can you women were expected to make sacrifices for uh, the family mm-hmm. uh, didn't have much freedom to work uh, outside the four uh, walls good so uh, diwar and mother india both reflect this okay. that women are supposed to be in a certain way 
Okay. So, that raises certain questions about the status of women, therefore, the importance of family melodramas and women's pictures. So, they should not be just dismissed off as yet another weeping movie or VP. Okay. They have something to tell us about our own social cultural practices. That is what Molly Haskell decided. Would anyone else like to comment on that? Shweta, Karthik? Highlight the sort of like roles that people are expected to play. Yeah. Like in Divad, the idea of the mother, hmm? what it like implies in the, the, the way the character relates to the mother and the way the mother relates to the son. Yeah. That also tells us something about the way society. Well, mother is nation. You see, in both in this is very important to understand, both in mother India and in Divar, mother is a metaphor for the nation. There are two warring brothers in both Divar and Mother India. And who are those two warring brothers? We are talking about the post partition scenario. So, mother will always go with the more virtuous son, that is the idea. Okay, so, it, there is a strong metaphor there, there is a sub, subtext there. It is not about just good versus evil. Mother personifies Mother India. The title of one of the movies tell us that. Yeah. Ram Lakhan, hmm? Karan Arjun. Yes, whenever mothers are uh, brutalized or victimized, then there would be her good sons. There is another great uh, classic melodrama directed by uh, a yesteryear actor director Manoj Kumar, and he made a classic called Upkar. Perhaps you, some of you, would like to take down the name. It's a Hindi movie, highly melodramatic, but extremely significant to understand the concept of patriotism, motherhood and nation, Upkar. Again a classic story of a mother torn between two brothers. One brother has gone abroad and he comes back with all westernized corrupt values, you know he smokes drinks and is always clubbing, because he has been to London you see, that is the reason. And another boy who stays back in India and sings patriotic songs and ploughs the fields and romances a nice Indian girl, he is the good son and he is even called Bharat. Understand? And then at the end there is a, a fight between Bharat and the villains and what happens that our hero loses both his arms. That is very significant. What does it suggest? Partition of India. Okay. But then he never dies, you know, because Bharat never dies. Okay. He exists and the, uh, and the prodigal son, the other brother, the evil brother returns and he says, now I am your hands, you know, these, these two hands, now they belong to you. So, there was always this wishful thinking that one, especially in post partition scene, that one day we will all come back together, even the brother who has left us, the erring Aaron brother. He will come back and get together. The, this is something that was implicit in e, uh, all these lost and found films. Therefore, we have a title like Amar Akbar Anthony, people of all caste, communities, regions, states coming together and uh, living happily after, ever after, harmonious existence. Again a wishful thinking, post partition, that there may be a time when we will all come back. Yeah history has told us something else, okay. but th there was a time when cinema was much more utopian, idealistic and uh, naive perhaps, much more innocent and those films indicated this tendency. You have uh, Mr. Yash Chopra recently passed away and uh, you must have read any number of articles on his work. So, his first major blockbuster movie was called Vakt, made sometime in 1960s. How many of you have seen Vakt? Do watch it, it is a blockbuster, it has a mega cast for those times and a beautiful colorful movie. Again it is about a disruption of a family, Hindu joint family and how it gets disrupted and then all, everyone loses everyone. At the end, 
everyone comes together with good, appropriate, suitable daughters-in-law. Okay. So, that was a theme. So, what was the first movie to deal with the lost and found theme? But it was not just lost and found idea. What was being suggested? One day we will all come back and live together uh, happily ever after. Yeah. So, met melodrama in other words has a lot to tell us about the socio -pol political and cultural significance of a period. Now, uh, there is another scholar Thomas Elsa Esser and who maintained in 1972 that melodrama can be analyzed through complex mise en scene and ideological criticisms. You do understand what is an ideology. To wish that uh, all uh, communities and states in India will live together ideology is a, however utopian is an ideology of some sort, right. So, that is ideology that I am giving you in a very simplistic terms that this is what ideology if you want to look at, but you know blacks and whites in America they will live together happily and harmoniously, there would not be any racial roids, there would not be any discrimination. Uh, the, uh, many movies of that period did show that there would there would be a time when everyone would coexist extremely happily and we were talking about seven the film remember where we said that uh, uh, Morgan Freeman's uh, race does not come into the picture at all. Okay. So, there ideology is something else in seven does seven have an ideology or is just a psychological crime drama. Any has an ideology too. Yeah, but it is not very in your face ideology. Yeah, like Fight Club, Fight Club has a very distinct ideology, a seven may not, but that what I am trying to say is that the hero's skin does not matter at all in seven. But if you watch all movies by Spike Lee, do the right thing, then there is an ideology. So, therefore, and it is they are all melodramatic. Right? Do the right thing is as melodramatic as they come. Racial roids, one fine day in New York between two races, Italian Americans and the black Americans. And um, there is this man Saul who has been living in this black dominated area for a very long time. He runs a pizzerio and at the end the pizzerio is burned down by a group of black people, because they feel they have been discriminated against by the whites. So, Saul's pizzerio which has been there as an indicative of racial harmony, a white existing in a uh, majority black area, black dominated area and the pizzerio is burned down. This was the place where everyone would come together and it is uh, very, very interestingly marked by uh, because he is Italian American. So, Saul's Pizzeria has posters of Al Pacino, uh, Sophia Loren, John Travolta and who are these people? All Italians, all white and Italians. Travolta is white, um, uh, is an Italian immigrant too. Yeah. Al Pacino of course and Sophia Loren. So, the blacks ask him that why do not you ever put, put up uh, a black actor's picture poster and he just dismisses it off. He said, I do not feel any need to do that okay, and that he has to pay at the end by having his pizzeria burnt down. So, that is what Thomas Elsa means when he said that melodrama can be analyzed through its complex mise en scene. If you look at the wall, Al Pacino, Sophia Loren and uh, mm, John Travolta's posters on that, it creates a kind of mise en scene. Right? This is what he is. Uh, in the beginning of the movie, we are not told this at all that there is going to be any kind of um, racial disharmony in this place. But the mise en scene tells us, tells us very clearly that this is a man who only believes in Italian Americans. Okay, so, all the hidden prejudices come to the fore one fine day and the breakdown of peace. Uh, Elsa Esser also considers the family melodramas of the 1950s as the peak of Hollywood's achievement. Now, many people are dismissive and very derisive of melodrama of Hayes Code, 
but then many scholars today believe that the golden age period of Hollywood was when Hayes code was in existence and when melodramas were at their peak. Okay. So, that is uh, something that needs to be discussed and um, in melodrama you do not find much psychological debating of characters like in seven, like in fight club. Okay. So, you will not that is quite postmodernist. Taxi driver is an out and out interior movie. Okay, much of the action happens inside his mind. Uh, there is another scholar, Geoffrey Noel Smith. At the moment, you can just consider the names and look them up at your convenience. Geoffrey Noel Smith, and he argues that in melodrama, especially in the films of Douglas Sirk one finds an interplay of class and sex, gender values play a very important part and class. And if you watch Douglas Sirk's movies today, how many of you are familiar with any of the films? We will be discussing, but Douglas Sirk does he mean anything to you? Not really. Vimal? Not now. Okay, not so far no. Okay. Douglas Sirk was a European left wing intellectual, he started his career in Germany and the other day we were talking about several directors during this period migrated to America. Remember Fritz Lang, Billy Wilder, William Wyler, remember these names, several great directors from Germany to America. Uh, in America, he worked during the Atmos repressive atmosphere of the 50s. Why do we call that a repressive atmosphere? Not really. His code is not by itself McCarthy period, H U A C. We were talking about Elia Kazan, Arthur Miller, remember? Okay, so, H U A C, the communist phobia that existed. So, from one repressive regime to another. And then, in spite of that, scholars believe that Sirk managed to make films that are critical of the prevailing ideology. And now, they are, he is not playing handball with the dominant ideology, he is actually being subversive if you read between the lines. That is what scholars like Geoffrey Noel Smith believe about Douglas Sirk. Remember, he is talking about criticizing certain ideological tendencies in America and certain uh, tendencies about the interplay of class and sex in America. So, Douglas Sirk's movies are a critique, uh, offer an interesting and important critique of those tendencies. Uh, in Germany, he was influenced by the works of Bertolt Brecht and Robert Weil. Brecht and Weil were collaborators. Weil was a producer, also a music director. Brecht, of course, is the theatre director who gave us the theme of theory of, yes, Brecht, that is our talk. Brecht gives us alienation, yeah, theatre of alienation. What is alienation? Breaking the fourth wall. Okay. Instead of you remember I told you shedding tears from your mind and not from your heart. So, that most of melodrama focuses on shedding tears from your heart, yeah. but Brecht believed in shedding tears from your mind, from your brain. So, uh, scholars also believe that because uh, uh, Douglas Sirk created a strong mise en scene using strong, so these are the features of mise en scene, strong primary colors, contrast of dark and light, exaggerated acting and gestures, and settings, thereby creating a strong mise en scene. So, that was one element of creating uh, or making his uh, melodramatic features. 
emotional access we already understand and then background music which tells not just shows. So, we were the other day some I, Shweta and Tara were talking about the song Kabhi Khushi Kabhi Gam which recurs so frequently. Um, it makes the movie extremely saccharine sweet right that is the idea. So, that is the idea to play on emotions to manipulate emotions and all the emotions are basically saccharine sweet. So, emotional excesses and telling background music hallmark of Douglas Sirk's melodramas. And um, his uh, one major film is Written on the Wind 1956 and Kaidu cinema critics were extremely interested in this film because of the way he uses mise en scene. And it is generally believed that his ironic mise en scene operated on 1950s middle class America. I am taking you ba back to the original ideas that they offered, his films offered a critique of the then uh, prevailing ideologic ideologies in America and also the interplay between class and gender. All that heaven allows, Jane Wyman, Rock Hudson directed by Douglas Sirk. Um, consider the mise en scene, I give you one minute. Consider the mise en scene, uh, it is one of those impossible love stories. An older woman, a younger man, woman, uh, uh, woman's situation is much more complicated because she is also a widow with grown up children. She falls in love with this uh, uh, protagonist who is also her gardener. Now, we were talking about mise en scene and ideological considerations. Can you give me some indication, some idea of what this mise en scene tells you all about? Uh, do you find deep focus here? We have been talking about deep focus, which is the focus is not just on what is foregrounded, but also on things which are in the background. So, the you know, understand the way he uses colors, decor, and also uh, the cinematography which exploits the background details as well. Now, tell me what do you find? Okay. It seems pretty uh, stark. Yes. And uh, the interior scene. Uh, cozy. cozy. Yeah. Interiors are cozy, but it is no, it is cold, it is frozen. Okay. That is her condition. Okay. She is dressed. Almost, uh, always in very subdued colors, whereas his couch is warm, it is uh, uh, you know it, it suggests something which is bright and happy, okay. but then of course, she cannot and why, why, why what is the significance of that a little fawn. Return to happiness perhaps, return to uh, a, a more idyllic, more idealized form of life, but then at the end she is denied happiness and this is the way the movie be and look at the primary colors. When you see colors like this definitely you know you are not watching a David Fincher movie. Yeah. So, how filmmakers you make use of colors to tell you that look this is a romantic picture, this is a women's picture. Yeah. So, what colors do you find here? bright pastels, oranges, all these things yeah and nicely the title, title also is pretty melodramatic all that heaven allows. So, play of class and sex is carried out in the iconography of the film, okay, but let me first talk to you about all that heaven allows and how does it end. Okay, so, because the woman is a wealthy widow and the man is uh, her lover is a poor gardener um, and she is much older to him. So, therefore, they cannot be united at the end after all it is 1956. Okay. So, what happens at the end her grown up children um, ask the man to leave the place. Okay. Uh, also think of a movie like uh, Lady Chatterley's lover right because um, it is the same idea repeated, but in much more. Uh, subtle and uh, 
you know platonic terms. So, uh, the hero is at the end asked by the children to leave the house and one, uh, he leaves and the woman knows that he is leaving today, they cannot even uh, uh, say their final goodbyes to each other. And then the woman's son very uh, suggestively gifts his mother with a television, okay, that this is your life, you know, you are a widow, you are wealthy, you do not have to worry about cinema, uh, about uh, anything in the world, about a materialistic aspects of, uh, of life. Just sit at home comfortably, we are there to look after you, watch television. Now, what does it tell you about class and sex? That is the way it ends. She sits and she switches on the television set and the movie ends. And what, uh, any comment on the class? If only the man belonged to the same social status. Perhaps her children would not have had that much of an objection, but mother falling for a gardener, that is one thing. So, class, sex, of course, you know, a woman of a certain age is not supposed to have these tendencies or romantic notions. Okay. She is supposed to accept that she had a husband once, she lost her husband when she was pretty young, she raised her children. Such a woman has no right to expect love or a man's affection at her age. Okay. She is not extremely old, you know, just like perhaps in her late thirties or early forties, but she is a, anyway regarded as a relics and you are supposed to sit at home and watch television. Okay. So, a lot of commentary on the class and gender situations of the time. Um, another movie written on the wind. Now, look at the mise en scene again here, the prism of conspicuous consumption and decor, costume and how spaces are utilized in the film. There is a woman, the heroine as played by Lauren Bacall. Lauren Bacall, uh, perhaps some of you have watched her, the big sleep to have or have not. So, the, the great Lauren Bacall, who was once married to Humphrey Bogart and um, her husband, who is a playboy, an extremely wealthy playboy and then Rock Hudson arrives on the scene, who falls in love with uh, the lady of the house. Okay. It is a loveless marriage, husband is a, an alcoholic, a playboy, there are lots of problems in this marriage. The marriage is all, already on the verge of collapse. And then this nice young man arrives on the scene and you see his reflection in the mirror, mise en scene and decor. Tell me, comment on the decor and mise en scene. Written on the Wind is Douglas Sirk's most popular movie. Kaidu cinema critics have just gone berserk praising it to the skies because of its strong melodrama. Yeah. So, not such a derisive genre. Okay, but something that has to be understood and to be analyzed. What do you see, Vimal? Some dichotomies explain hmm? basically split into two with the student panel somewhere there. There are this guy, it's not finger on the shot, but he is very much visible on the mirror because it's probably a strong presence. Yeah. And the husband perhaps is reflected to the sidelines. Hmm. So, so you see central so image is that of the man who is going to be her lover soon. Yeah, husband is relegated to the sidelines already. And the woman is strong, bold, confident, yes, smart. And then you see signs and tropes of conspicuous consumption. So, we are being told this is a wealthy family. The way they look, the way, the, their body language, the decor of the house, everything is very extremely suggestive. Um, now, here uh, look at uh, this particular scene, the lady is walking and uh, with her husband, of course, he is still her, they are still married to each other and then she is followed by this would be lover in the background and uh, there is uh, something in the background, very conspicuous, Cupid okay. 
and Cupid comes between the wife and the potential lover. So, this is the way attention to detail was given. So, Douglas Sirk melodrama and if you watch our movies, they are extremely high on creation of melodrama through mise en scene. Yeah. Think, can you think of certain, I mean the other day you gave examples from Kavi Kushigam. Okay, so, it is full of such uh, symbols and signs. All kinds of uh, tropes are there or you know, what is foregrounded, what is there in the background, what are we supposed to understand, use of background music. Um, written on the wind and here the lady is looking at the poet, I mean uh, the which is that iconography? What is that? In the background is her father's portrait, her late father's portrait and now she is occupying his seat. She has in her inherited all the wealth and she is with the same image okay, of a same model. They are in the construction business as her late father used to be. So, what does that suggest? She has taken over the mantle of her father. So, Sirk, important films by Douglas Sirk and all extremely important to understand the notion of melodrama in the 50s, all that heaven allows. We have been talking Vimal quite frequently about a movie called Far From Heaven. Yeah, it is a reinterpretation of this film. All I desire, magnificent obsession, written on the wind, there is always tomorrow, a time to love and a time to die, an imitation of life. If you consider the titles, uh, they alone sound like kabhi khushi kabhi gam, kabhi alvida na kehna, that kind of. Yeah, so extremely melodramatic and extremely in your face. Yeah, so, we are still talking about our classic Hollywood and melodrama as an integral feature of it. So, uh, 50s and it was also the period which witnessed the emergence of the so called anti-hero and one of the major actors of this generation was Marlon Brando. We have already been talking about um, method acting. So, this period witnessed the emergence of uh, method acting, which by 70s came into its own, Pacino's, Hoffman's and De Niro's, Nicholson's, but 50s saw uh, consciousness about a different kind of acting, which was not the true cinematic acting. I mean, if you watch a movie like Magnificent Obsession, all these Douglas Sirk's classics written on the wind. Mm, all that heaven allows, you will understand it was a very exaggerated kind of acting. Method acting changed the face of acting okay, by the 50s. So, Paul Newman, Marlon Brando and James Dean, the exponents of method acting. And what did they play? They were not the romantic heroes of the 40s and the 50s. They were no Gregory Pecks or highly principled heroes. What did they specialize in? They would play parts of heroes who were flawed, more angst ridden, anti establishment, gold diggers. So, we were talking about a place in the sun, Monty Clift and Elizabeth Taylor, where, Elizabeth, where Monty Clift is an unabashed gold digger. He ditches his pregnant girlfriend and falls for Elizabeth Taylor, who is much more prettier and definitely much more wealthier. Place in the Sun, directed by good George Stevens and based on a novel by Theodore Dreiser, an American tragedy. Classic Hollywood screenplay and the other day we were talking about Cecil B. DeMille and how screenplays were written. So, classic Hollywoods are still in that classic three act structure, the beginning, the middle and the end. It was also a time when producers dictated terms and interfered with the process of writing screenplays. 
and Vimal, when did this uh, procedure, this process end? Producers interfering with the process of writing. New Hollywood. We have been talking about Dennis Hopper and uh, Peter Fonda's Easy Rider. Okay, that was the movie that changed the face of Hollywood. <coughs> Before that, there was Bonnie and Clyde, and even before that, there was a hard day's night. Okay, so those are the films that you should be watching soon. Okay, and then you will understand that those movies completely jettison the idea of classic three act structure. There is no beginning, no middle, no end, and no closure. In Bonnie and Clyde, yes, they die, but in Easy Rider, again, it's quite open ended, and. Uh, um, a hard day's night is definitely uh, more, much more experimental than many films made that time. Uh, during the classical or the, during the classic Hollywood period, screenwriters were mainly journalists and novelists. So, they still drew on material from literature and journalistic sources. So, people like Faulkner. Tennessee Williams and even uh, a great writer like uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, he tried his hand at screenplay writing and much of his experiences with Hollywood is seen in The Last Tycoon, directed by Alaya Kazan, that we, what we have been talking about that also. Then uh, best selling authors, James Ken and Dashiell Hammett, Raymond Chandler and if you want to understand more about the art of classic screenplay, then I would refer, I would suggest that you read Sitfield's screenwriter's workbook. Have you done work on Robert Town? Did some homework? Yeah, tell me about Robert Town. Listen to this woman. Yeah. I mean, I know that he is the writer of uh, Bonnie and Clyde. So okay. Like, Credited or uncredited? I do not know that. Yeah. Robert Town is the uncredited writer of for Robert uh, for uh, Bonnie and Clyde okay and he remained uncredited for majority of his films that's very interesting but he got rich by remaining uncredited yeah, he would just take money he, he, he was like today we call this uh, set of people as spin, uh, uh, script doctors so he majorly did script doctoring for people uh, could have been could have been who, who knows that there is every possibility, but then he became so prominent, so influential and so ma magnificently wealthy. I mean, if you read uh, works on Robert Town, you will understand he was much more wealthier than many of his uh, uh, peers who were successful Hollywood directors. So, that is the power of Robert Town, a very interesting personality. So, you must read upon him. On the waterfront, Again, we were talking about it the other day while discussing Alaya Kazan follows the same structure. Alaya Kazan for all his uh, affection for social realism and all happens to be quite a traditional kind of a filmmaker. So, follows the tradition quite faithfully. You have watched East of Eden, so you know and that is also a material based on novel by John Steinbeck. So, these were the great movies, The Hustler by Paul, uh, starring Paul Newman, faithfully following the classic screenplay structure. A Place in the Sun, the movie I was just referring to, starring Elizabeth Taylor, Monty Clift and George Steven is the director. Any comments you would like? Now, let us talk about Robert Town. What was the question again? New Hollywood, he is not classic. Remember, Bonnie and Clyde is a watershed film, which came and heralded the age of New Hollywood. So, Robert Town marks the New Hollywood, not classic Hollywood. Yes? So, Rob, Bonnie and Clyde onwards, we saw a complete change. Uh, in the way scripts were written. Easy Rider 
um, Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda who wrote the screenplay. Dennis Hopper always took the credit and Peter Fonda said he never wrote a word. <laughs> okay, there were there have been lot, but then Dennis Hopper was violent and aggressive and always carry a gun with him. So, Peter Fonda said I had to give him the credit because I would never know what would happen if I do not. Okay, Dennis Hopper always car famously carried a gun. Yeah, so, that was the thing and the only man who could put him in his place was the great John Wayne who one day brought a bigger gun to the sets and he says come out Dennis Hopper wherever you are hidden after that Dennis Hopper maintained peace with John uh, Wayne. Easy Rider is the movie that changed the way screenplays were written because there was no screenplay. They would come on the sets and improvise, but the story idea was definitely Peter Fonda's. So, that is the story, but screenplay the classic three acts they were no longer observed. Yeah, so that was the, but Robert Town of course, was a very disciplined writer and he contributed Chinatown is a very disciplined screenplay. So, Robert Town's contribution is there, but then he also marks uh, a change in the way scripts were written in Hollywood and that we will be seeing when we uh, look at new Hollywood in much more detail. Any other questions? The other day someone was asking about, so where is Hitchcock in all this? So, Hitchcock is at the peak in classic Hollywood period and you have films that now are you know without a doubt undoubted classics. Even I confess with Monty Clift, which was which is not a widely seen movie. It, if you watch it, you find that there are there are so many redeeming features in it. It is one of his lesser known movies, but very, very interesting film. A Rope, I am sure mo most of you are familiar. All of you have watched? Okay, you must. Strangers on a Train, uh, his classic notorious North by Northwest with Cary Grant. So, Cary Grant and James Stewart were his favorite actors. He also worked with Gregory Peck in Spellbound with Ingrid Bergman, Salvador Dali worked on the dream sequences in Spellbound. Rebecca based on Daphne du Maurier's novel and he also did another Daphne du Maurier short story, Bird. The Bird. Yes. And now, Hitchcock is a very interesting director and there are two recent movies on him. So, uh, these are the books that I would suggest very strongly. There is a book called Screening the Past, Memory and Nostalgia in Cinema, The Oxford Guide to Film Studies by Kaplan and Kaplan, Pam Cook's Screening the Past and Kaplan's The Oxford Guide to Film Studies. You can just take down the titles. Thomas Elsa Esser, I was just talking to with reference to melodrama. So, there, uh, his paper is Tales of Sound and Fury, Observation on the Family Melodrama. George Novelli Smith's Minnelli and Melodrama, which Minnelli are we talking about? Vincent. Who was his famous daughter? Lisa Minnelli. And Lisa Minnelli's mother is the famous Judy Garland, Wizard of Oz actress and a star is born. Any questions here on classic age or golden age of Hollywood? From our next class onwards, we will start talking about the new Hollywood period. Any com comments or observations about this? So, that was melodrama and it is still a very popular genre at least in our country. All right then, we will continue. Thank you.